one of the things that Deng Xiaoping did uh, very soon after he came back to power was to uh, allow uh, uh, Chinese students to apply to go to uh, universities in the United States and also uh, Europe and Japan. The vast majority, of course, wanted to go to the United States. But it's such a contrast between what uh, Stalin was doing, had been doing in the Soviet Union, which, which, which was completely closed. And uh, Deng Xiaoping's rationale at the time was, he said, I know that maybe uh, three-fourths of the students we send abroad will never come back. But if only one-fourth come back and contribute to the development of China, then that will have been well worthwhile. The decision I took would, would have been well worthwhile. And uh, it's an example of his uh, pragmatism, I think. I had mentioned the Jenguo Hotel as introducing the concept of service. Thank you to hotel managers. Uh, but along the educational line, this was another thing, another seed that was planted uh, during this, it must have been about 83, when um, Steve Muller, president of Johns Hopkins University, came to Beijing. He'd been, he and, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the Chinese American who was a physicist on, on the faculty there at Johns Hopkins, and he had arranged this introduction for Steve Muller. They called on the uh, appropriate officials in Nanjing proposing this joint educational foundation between Nanjing University and Johns Hopkins. The idea was that you'd have American co-director, you'd have a Chinese co-director. American students or international students uh, would study in Chinese with Chinese professors. Chinese students would study in English with American professors. And the two would room together, in other words, Chinese would share a room with an international student. They came to Beijing, and we saw them briefly when Muller explained what this, this whole concept was, and he said that the Chinese seemed quite receptive. Well, I said, I think it would be great if it comes to pass. And he was skeptical as to whether or not the Chinese would, would accept this idea. Oh, and there was to be an open library there at the, uh, at the center. Well, it did come to pass. And uh, two years ago, I was out there for the 20th anniversary of the opening of the Hopkins Nanjing Center. It started out by awarding a certificate uh, to the participants in the, they did not, there's not a degree granting institution, but uh, as of two years ago, well, four years ago, it is now a degree granting institution. It can grant an MA and also a PhD. It is affiliated, it is administered by uh, SAIS Johns Hopkins, which is an adjunct of, uh, of SAIS, and I know several of you, um, along with myself, I may be the oldest one here, as a graduate of SAIS. But this is an educational joint venture. It was the first of its kind in China, uh, and it was quite unique, and I know one or two of my husband's colleagues said to him at the time, you know, we wish we'd thought of that. <laughs> Um, it's a little known fact that more students and scholars left China to go to abroad for education in September 89 than had gone in September 88. Uh, that is after Tiananmen versus before Tiananmen. Well, I'm just going to ask a question since we were talking about, about education here. And it just is my impression that uh, Chinese higher education has just expanded and become you know, much more, I won't say significant, but it's become much better in recent years. I can't answer that question. I'm sure Charm Weekend and maybe anybody, anybody on the panel who wants to. Um, so China's, in other words, entire educational resources have certainly. I was just growing and become more During the Cultural Revolution, most of the universities were closed, obviously. So it was not until the early 80s that uh, economics departments, law departments, and national affairs departments uh, within the universities were really open, reopened again. And obviously, the expansion of the system has been 
almost unbelievable. And increasingly, uh, experimentation with reform and teaching methodology. Move away from rote learning and memorization and what a more traditional style of, of the lecture and the students listening. Talking about the public advocacy of a change to a directly elected, popularly elected government and, uh, and move away from the party state, you're likely to find yourself, uh, uh, if not detained, uh, severely restricted. If you're talking about legal aid, uh, advocating or uh, providing services uh, for in, to advance women's and children's rights, uh, there's now space to do that. A number of organizations um, are performing those kinds of roles. Civil society more broadly um, has increasingly found the space to advocate things like uh, and to demonstrate to reduce environmental degradation. Uh, the number of subjects in which you could be more active and organized to be more active has progressively increased. The, the cyclical versus secular phenomenon still operates. When, when things are, um, when they're un, uneasy with a lot of, as they are this year, the, the risks that one ro uh, runs in being more seemingly in opposition to what the government has already um, indicated it's okay to do, the risks become higher. But during the relaxation period, they, you know, the risks decline. While, while just generally speaking, one can see repeated examples of uh, the, the openness for public uh, action has been growing. How about protesting against official corruption or mistreatment? Public demonstrations generally are not going to be well received by the Public Security Bureau. Uh, I, I don't know how to generalize about it. Obviously, there have been demonstrations when, when, uh, when tenants have felt uh, ill-treated by their landlords. There have been demonstrations to prevent the building of a factory that the local population thought would be polluting of the atmosphere. There have been demonstrations, of course, against official corruption. But how peaceful they are, how what the general environment is when they occur, will all influence um, what happens as a result. Going from nothing to imprisonment and everything in between would be the way I would answer that. I don't know how to, more, uh, how to generalize more broadly than that. I'm just wondering about comparing it to 20 years ago. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, no contrast whatsoever in terms of it being more space. It's just, you know, that you can talk about the class that's half empty or half full. It was empty in, in this respect 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's now half, half full, I want to put it that way. Also, you know, we tend to talk about human rights meaning civil and political liberties. And usually when we use the term, that's exactly what we mean. And those who advocate stigmatizing and sanctioning China for those abuses only talk about civil and political liberties. And so you can understand why the Chinese are somewhat mm, offended by that approach, uh, since they, the scale, scope, and significance of the reforms in, in reducing abject poverty has been unprecedented. So as economic and social rights, they claim uh, uh, and can point legitimately to, to major advances. Uh, infant mortality rates, uh, literacy rates uh, are very, very high in China. Longevity is very high in China. So on the economic and social side, there's been dramatic improvement. On the civil and political side, it's lagged behind and nowhere near what we would, we would find acceptable or desirable. Society. 